but the question itself says if u is a orthogonal matrix, we need to show that the, for such a matrix, the only option for the determinant is to be plus or minus one. Uh, there is a competing concept to the orthogonal one. It's called the unitary matrix. Both of them actually presented. I mean, both definitions presented as a, like a part of the some questions in the yellow book. It's just, uh, I say competing because orthogonal matrix is normally the one which appears when you deal with the real numbers, whereas the unitary one, which appears often when you deal with the complex numbers. And there is a similar question relating to um, unitary matrix in the yellow book. In the argument which I'm going to show right now, it will work for that question as well, even though the conclusion there is different. It says that every determinant of every unitary matrix is the unital complex number. It's the complex number which sits on the unital circle on the complex number. But here, here's the argument. So definition of the orthogonal matrix is this one. It's the matrix which makes this happen. So it's the one it's the one which you multiply by its transposed, and you end up with the identity of the appropriate size, obviously. No, actually, I should correct myself. Uh, I should say multiply both ways. That's the proper definition of the unitary uh, orthogonal matrix. By implication, this will, I mean, this will imply in particular that you use a square matrix. I didn't say this explicitly, but you will be a square matrix because if it's not, the determinant doesn't make sense. So you have to first make sure that every orthogonal matrix is a square matrix. It is square. Uh, this will, I mean, if you remember one of the questions we did with you, one of the questions we did with you where we studied the size of the matrix, matrices quite uh, closely, when the products make sense, if you use that argument, it will show you the U, like this, any matrix which makes this happening will be necessarily a square matrix. Well, like I said, the argument itself is very easy. You just have to use this property that determinant of a product of two matrices is a product of individual determinants. If you know that property, the argument for this, for this, for this question is basically a one line. Look what you do. You just make this observation. You start with this simple thing, like a determinant of identity, which is, we all know, what's the determinant of the identity? One, because identity is a very easy, like a simplest of all example of row echelon form. And we know the determinant of the row echelon form is a product of the elements on the diagonal. Identity has all ones on the diagonal. The other actually argument I presented for you when we discussed with you diagonal matrices, if we discussed with the diagonal matrices, if you remember. We also discovered that the determinant of a diagonal matrix is a product of the elements on the diagonal. Now you replace your identity with one of these, doesn't matter which one, or one of these. Now I'm gonna, that's the principal step of the whole argument. I'm gonna use the fact that the determinant of the product is a product of individual determinants. Pay attention, here you have the matrix product, and here you have the product between numbers even though we use the same word and basically the same symbol. And the last thing which we're going to use is that something we discovered with you last week, determinant of the transpose matrix is the same as the determinant of the original matrix. And that's why you end up with the determinant square. So you have one equal to unknown determinant square. The only option for that determinant, so the only option now you have is that determinant is plus or minus one. 